All right, good morning and welcome back for the link. We are <clears throat> starting a uh, just a two-part series this morning uh, entitled Unity, Unity, Unity. Uh, and we're going to be looking specifically at a uh, letter of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Um, as I <clears throat> had mentioned to you all a few weeks ago in a prior series, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch was a bishop. He lived around the end of the first century uh, into the second century. Uh, he died, he was martyred in the year 107 AD. And he wrote, uh, his first of the seven letters that he wrote was this letter uh, entitled uh, Ignatius to the Ephesians. Now, what I've done is I've, I've printed out uh, a copy of half of the letter for you this week, and we'll do the rest of it next week, the second half of it uh, this week. And I've, I've just added some, some sort of footnotes and notes ac or across the paper, uh, so you kind of have an idea of what's going on uh, through it, and we'll work our way through uh, this text, all right? So just right out of the gate, let me mention, highlight, that uh, uh, Ignatius was a disciple. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we said that St. Ignatius was a disciple of John, the disciple of our Lord, right? Uh, the other person that we had mentioned that he had that St. John had discipled was a man by the name of Polycarp uh, of Smyrna, who was one of Ignatius's contemporaries. And in fact, one of the seven letters that St. Ignatius writes is to Polycarp. Okay, so uh, it's it's a uh, uh, nice that we're looking at uh, one of the apostolic fathers, which is one of the fathers who was a disciple of the disciples of Jesus, all right? So we've got our Lord Jesus Christ. We've got the 12, one of those 12, actually one of the inner three, uh, Peter, James, and John. So one of John's disciple we're going to be looking at, which is Ignatius uh, and this specific letter to the Ephesians. The entire letter, if I had to say that there was one theme for the entire letter, it would be the theme of unity, okay? Uh, if anyone is buying real estate, uh, there is one, usually one thing that most realtors will tell you, which is what? Location, right? Location, location, location. It's all about location. You can have the most beautiful house from the inside and the outside, and it's exquisite and everything, but if it's in the wrong location, if it's in a bad part of town, if it's right on a major highway, if there is um, electrical poles around it, if it's in a terrible location, doesn't matter how beautiful it may appear, um, if location is key. In the church, that issue of location for the early Christians was unity. Okay? Unity was at the core of the teaching of not only uh, the letter we're going to be looking at this morning, but throughout the New Testament uh, canon. Okay? St. Paul stresses the importance of unity all throughout the scriptures. And today's letter... Uh, it, uh, St. Ignatius' letter to the Ephesians stresses, stresses this point. It's unity, unity, unity. Throughout this letter, you're going to find uh, over 20 direct references to unity and probably at least 30 to 40 uh, references to the idea of unity, harmony, oneness, uh, being together, being united, all that. Being one. Uh, being around the table, being with the one bishop, being that, that image of unity, you can't escape it. We're going to be going through this whole letter, and that's going to be something that I think will jump out to you loud and clear. Tradition suggests that the author of this specific letter, Ignatius, and I put this for you in your, your footnote down there, number two on the very bottom of the page, suggests that it was the child that our Lord, if you remember, our Lord brought a child on his lap and said, unless if you become converted as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So early tradition suggests that that little child is in fact Ignatius of Antioch. So this is someone who was not only a disciple of John, but he had interacted in all likelihood on some level with Christ, even if as a young child he may or may not have understood 
exactly who this man was that was standing in front of him and what he was about to do. One of the themes that you're going to see throughout this letter on unity um, is, and, and really throughout several of Ignatius' letters, is the idea of suffering. Now, why this is important, uh, and, and he actually, right out of the beginning here, we'll just look at the first, the prologue. He says, Ignatius, who is also Theophorus, uh, Theophorus was most likely a name he gave to himself, meaning God-bearer, okay? It was either given to him or he gave it to himself. He just, he was, he was the one who, he saw himself as someone who carried God um, around uh, with him, that this was something that confirmed his Christian calling. So he says, Ignatius to her, her being the church, which has been blessed in greatness through the fullness of God the Father, which has been foreordained before the ages, forever unto abiding unchangeable glory, united and elected in a passion truly suffered. Okay? Now, Ignatius is writing this letter as he's getting ready to be martyred. And he, in fact, writes seven letters on his way to Rome to be martyred. Most, most historians suggest that he wrote this along with three other letters when he was in Smyrna with Polycarp, and that when he escapes from there, or either escapes or is transported to Syria, most likely trans uh, escaped, goes to Syria, he knows his martyrdom is coming. It's inevitable. Okay? He's been on the run for years. He now goes to Syria and he writes the other three letters, one to, one to Polycarp and then two others. One of them is to the church in Rome, the church that he's about to go to or the city that he's about to go to to be martyred in. So he is acknowledging that it is for him joyous to suffer with Christ. And he's not the first one to say that, by the way. St. Paul in Philippians says that we have been granted not only to believe in the name of Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. He's saying, I am, for me to, to acknowledge myself as a disciple of Christ, I'm not escaping my own call to suffer for the name of Christ, to take up my own cross and to walk with him. So he writes this letter to the church of Ephesus, which is in, in Asia or Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. He had not yet visited this church in Ephesus, but Ephesus is important because number one, St. Paul had preached there. He had established a church there. You also find in the book of Revelation that there are seven churches that are mentioned. The first of those seven churches is Ephesus. We're going to talk a little bit more, uh, most likely next week, about why Ephesus, you find a level of importance there. But on a, on, a, um, uh, on a civil level, it's important because it's a trade port. It's a big trade port. There's a, it's along the main, one of the main trade routes. But it's also important, I believe, in the book of, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, listed as the first of the seven churches, because some people suggest that when St. John took St. Mary, the mother of our Lord, they went to Ephesus for a period of time and were housed in that place. Okay? It's a place that is mentioned a couple times in the book of Revelation. Uh, and it's again, it's mentioned first, which tells us it was important. So he writes this letter to this community. And he's telling them again, I am not going to escape my suffering. That when Hard times come, I'm not going to run from Christ. I'm going to carry my cross and follow him. Because after all, the disciple is not above the master. Chapter 1, the whole chapter is about sharing in his name, the name of Christ, by becoming an imitator of God. He begins off in chapter 1, Why welcome in God your well-beloved name, which you bear by natural rights, in a virtuous mind, by faith and love, in Christ Jesus our Savior, being imitators of God. And right below that, he tells them that they were perfectly fulfilled, perfectly fulfilled your pleasant, their, the pleasant work. The fact that they have a well-beloved name simply means that they're people of high character. That there are people that are virtuous. And he suggests so much when he says that they have a natural right. They are known all over the world because 
they have a high level of commitment to Christ. So, being known as a community, what we can get from this, being known as a Christian, is not about how much noise or activities we do, but rather how high the degree of our Christian character and virtue is. And this is what makes these people in Ephesus known. It's not because they have built the biggest building. It's not because they have the best sounding choir in church. It's not because they have the most eloquent speakers preaching. It's not because they've sent out the most missionaries. It's because they have a high Christian character. They're virtuous people. And so he says, I've heard of your well-beloved name. And their well-beloved name became because they became imitators of Christ. They became imitators of our Lord. If you scroll down a little bit to the fifth line, it says, I was on my way from Syria in bonds for the sake of the common name, the common name being Christ and hope, and was hoping through your prayers to succeed in fighting with wild beasts in Rome. He's saying, I'm going to the arena, and don't try to stop me. <laughs> He's not trying to escape. He's saying, I'm just simply hoping that I can make it as a disciple. Seeing then that in God's name I have received your whole multitude. Sorry, so, so by succeeding I might have power to be a disciple. He's saying, what, what's he saying here? He's saying, for me to be a disciple, it means I'm not going to escape from what my own master had done by taking up the cross. Okay? He's saying that the power of discipleship is in not fleeing the cross. You were eager to visit me, seeing then that in God's name I've received your whole multitude in the person of Onesimus. Now, Onesimus he later says, shortly after, he says that he's your bishop in the flesh. The distinction there in the flesh is because ultimately Christ is the bishop, the overseer par excellence. He is the bishop. So that Poly, uh, uh, Ignatius is acknowledging himself in one of his other letters. He says, though I am your bishop and I'm about to be martyred, your eternal bishop will never leave you and will provide someone else for you, by the way, once I'm gone, to be your bishop in the flesh. Onesimus is the first name that's going to jump out to you. Onesimus is the bishop at the time of Ephesus. Okay? So there's a few people we're going to find here, but we, we, we see this idea of unity, but there's going to be unity around certain things. You're going to have unity around a bishop, you're going to have unity around the Eucharist. You're going to have unity around the truth. And those three things for Ignatius in all seven of his letters are indispensable. You can't miss them. Okay? Unity around the bishop, the Eucharist, and the truth are essential. So Onesimus is there and he's saying, in receiving your bishop, I've received all of you. He has come as your representative and in so doing, I've received you. It's as if in a corporate meeting, one of the VPs is sent to a place, and that place receives that person as if they are coming to receive the entire corporation because they have been sent as an ambassador to carry the, 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 the message of the corporation. When an ambassador of a country goes to a place, they don't go to speak whatever they think. The question is never, what do you think about something? It's what message are you carrying from the State Department or from the President? And this is how Ignatius receives Onesimus. And quite frankly, this is how we should receive one another. Is that when we receive each other, we receive each other as if we're receiving the entire, the entire body. He goes on and, 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 sorry, one other thing about Onesimus that's really, really interesting. Many church historians, if, if you have your Bibles, you can look in the letter to Philemon. St. Paul's uh, shortest letter. It's right before the letter to the uh, Hebrews. 
He says, therefore, starting in verse 8, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such, as, such a one as Paul, sorry, this is Philemon writing. I'm sorry, sorry, backing up. Paul and, Tim uh, and Timothy are sending this letter. Okay, he's saying, being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So Paul is putting himself into the letter. He's saying, I myself have made myself a slave for Christ. And this is what the entire letter of Philemon is all about, is this, this slave that is not being let go. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. So in all likelihood, Paul begets, if you will, he uh, draws or calls Onesimus to the Christian faith. And then John the Beloved disciples him. Okay? So, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, Christ brought the increase. Okay? Paul did some work, John did some work, ultimately, Christ brought the increase. But in all likelihood, this is what most church historians suggest. This is the Onesimus that we're talking about. What's interesting about this? You have a guy who is a slave, who is now a bishop of one of the largest church communities in the world at the time. Okay? So when people say, well, I'm not qualified, I'm not equipped, <laughs> I'm not, we've got Onesimus here to prove to us otherwise. Christ did it with fishermen. He also did it with all sorts of people, including this young slave named Onesimus. The next line, he says, I pray that you may love him according to Jesus Christ, that you all may be like him, for blessed is he that granted you according to your deserving to have such a bishop. He's saying, you are such good people that God has blessed you to give you this wonderful bishop. And by the way, be like him, imitate him. This is similar language that St. Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where he tells the church of Corinth, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What we're being told here is that we become, we share the common name of Christ by becoming imitators of God. Okay? And we imitate him, and not as actors and actresses, but with an authentic life, an authentic spirit, an authentic heart, by what we witness in other people. Is, is that fair? Like, sometimes people think, pe sometimes people think, they're like, well, I'm just going to read the Bible and I'll figure it out. But the beauty of the church, historically, has been this notion of discipleship. And Jesus didn't say, go print the Bible and hand it to people and let them be, learn how to become disciples. He said, no, rather, go make disciples, teach them all things I've said to you. So what Ignatius here is telling the church of Ephesus is, you have this bishop named Onesimus, who himself is clearly an imitator of Christ. and He's one who lives like God. Learn from him. Learn from his example amongst you. Chapter 2. Chapter 2 he goes on and he transitions to this idea about submission and unity. And he basically says to us, if you want to live a holy life, there's two things that are important. Number one, of course, unity. The whole letter is about unity, right? So you know unity is going to be there. The second one is submission. Submission. But it's touching my fellow servant. We're going to now introduce a new guy. So we've got Onesimus the bishop. We've got a new person, the deacon. Burris, who by the will of God is your deacon, okay? Blessed in all things, I pray that he may remain with me to the honor of yourselves and of your bishop. So we've got this man named Burris who's there as a servant of theirs, as a deacon. And he goes on and says that I received him as a model for imitation of the love which you bear me. Ignatius knew their love. Be, through Burris, who came and carried their love to him. Okay? Burris comes 
and says, I'm coming to support you on behalf of these people. You know when someone is sick, or someone is just lost a loved one, well, oftentimes we will, and mom and dad, or husband and wife, or whoever it is, just can't make it. But if one of the people go, says, man, I, that family is a blessed family. I knew, I know the love of the family through this person who came and visited me. So Burris comes and carries with him his, the love of the entire community to support him at this time. And he says it serves as an, a model for the imitation of the love which they bear for him. The truth is we represent, when we're out, we represent the name. We represent the name that's above every name. And we also represent our family, our church family, and our, our organic families, right? Our, our home families, our family of origin. We represent many things when we're out. Parents, when your kids are out, one of the best compl compliments you can receive, no matter how much your kids might be lunatics at home, is when you hear, man, your kids are so well behaved. Your kids are great. We've never seen kids, and, and people might be lying, they might be trying to like make you feel good, whatever it might be, okay? Um, I'm sure your kids are great, but I mean, listen, when I hear that as a parent, I'm like, that is the best feeling in the world. When we're out in the world, we represent the name of Christ, and we also represent our faith community, our church. We represent Christ, we represent all of Christianity, and in a sense, we also represent our church family. You represent, if St. If, if Anianus is your home parish, you and you're out, you represent your home parish. People are not going to say, oh, we heard about this guy, Father Michael. No, they're going to say, we might hear something that he says, but the people in that parish are good people. We know that God is doing something special there, not because the guy can stand up and talk or, or he visits people or he talks, none of that stuff. He's, people are going to say, that's a good place because the people of God that are there are good people. That's what they're saying here. That's what Ignatius is saying here. He's saying that when you are out, you represent not only the name of Christ, but your, your church community. Your, your church, and ultimately the entire body of Christ, which is, I know for some people, they feel like that's a heavy burden, but I would tell you that that is a great responsibility and opportunity to witness to the name of Christ. The last few lines he says here, it is therefore worthy of you in every way to glorify Jesus Christ who glorified you. He's saying it's worthy for you to glorify Jesus, and by the way, he clearly glorified you. Glorify him. Give glory to him in all things, because I can see that he is working in your life. Being perfectly joined together, look at the number of images, joined together in one. <laughs> I mean, if there, I don't know how many more words he could have squeezed in to that small section. Joined together in one. In four words, he uses three synonyms to talk about unity. <laughs> He's basically telling us that we, when we're joined together in one submission, submitting ourselves to the bishop and priests, we will be sanctified in all things. When we seek out our unity and we're willing to submit to the teaching of the church, the teaching of Christ as communicated through the church, this leads to our holiness of life. Oftentimes I hear people say, I'm not sure I like that explanation of that verse. I'm not sure how I feel about that interpretation. I've sat with people oftentimes and tried to give them an honest interpretation or uh, explanation of the, the scripture according to an early Christian understanding, people say, it's interesting, I'm just not sure I'm comfortable with that for myself. 
if we're looking ultimately for our holiness of life, our sanctification, what Ignatius at least is suggesting, this is, this is just one first century bishop, okay? Who is not outside of the scope of the rest of scripture, by the way, and not outside of the teaching of Christ and, and the apostles. He's saying, seek unity and seek to submit to the voice of the authority of the church. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at a couple verses uh, later on the back. All right? So we've gone through, we share in his name by being imitators of God. Submit and Submission and unity bring sanctification. The third chapter is all, he says, unity in Christ comes by unity with the bishop. And he starts off importantly saying that that unity is not a unity of authoritarianism. Okay? Sometimes people look at the bishop and they say, he's there, we're here, he's big, I'm little, I'm nothing. And actually Ignatius puts the playing field here. He says, I do not command you as though I were somewhat. What's he saying? Somewhat. That's the way people spoke. I do not command you as though I were somewhat. He's saying, I'm not coming. I'm, there's nothing unique or extraordinary or special about me. But I've been given a role to instruct you and to teach you. And so for that reason, I'm, in, I'm teaching you. Okay? He's saying, I'm not commanding you as though I were something like extraordinary. For even though I'm in the bonds for the name, as to my schoolmates, <laughs> he is looking at the rest of the church and he's not looking at them as if they were less. What is being implied here is that his schoolmates share the, the same master, which is Jesus Christ, that they are, he is not the teacher and they are the students. But even if in reality that is the truth, but he's saying, I'm not seeing you in that way. They might say, listen, you're a teacher. He's saying, okay, but I'm your schoolmate. I'm here learning just along with you. People oftentimes ask, who does the Pope confess to? And sometimes, my friends, the Pope find some monk in a monastery or some priest in a small village in Egypt, and that is his father of confession or spiritual father. What... Ignatius is giving us a very important principle is no matter how high that we perceive, how high up a chain of responsibility, role, authority a person climbs or perceives to be put, that person is still a disciple of Christ. And Ignatius is saying, I'm your schoolmate. I'm here to learn along with you and to walk with you. The anointing that comes is the anointing that happens by the trainer, which is Christ himself. In verse 2 down there, he says, but since love does not allow me to be silent, he's saying, I'm so compelled by my love for you, I can't not speak. He starts off by saying, I don't command you as though I'm, I'm something special. He's just saying, I love you so deeply, I can't but speak to you. I can't but tell you the truth. The next line below, he says, Therefore, if I was forward to exhort you that you run in harmony with the mind of God, for Jesus Christ also are an inseparable life in the mind of the Father, even as the bishops that are settled in the farthest parts of the earth are in the mind of Jesus Christ. The main theme here is that the importance of unity, that Christ is one with the Father, the bishops, however far apart they may be from each other, are ultimately one in Christ. Chapter uh, three concludes with this image that we can simply see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 6 in the St. Paul's letter, not Ignatius's letter. Every morning we wake up and we pray the first hour in the Coptic canonical book of hours we call the Agbeya. Okay? And in that first hour we read the following passage from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or beg you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Think about the imagery of unity that he's talking about here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, 
who is above all and therefore all and in you all. It's this same language that was one of the earliest Trinitarian creeds here that we find in Ephesians. It's all about unity and submitting to one another. The submission is not a submission of authoritarianism. It's a willful submission, just as we find in the scripture, husbands and wives being commanded to submit to each other in love. Chapter 4. We're going to move through these last ones fairly quickly. I'll glaze over them quickly. You can read them at your leisure at home. Chapter 4, he talks about unity with the teaching of the church. He begins by saying, So then it is becoming for you to run in harmony with the mind of the bishop. The next line, he says, For your honorable priests, which are worthy, are attuned to the bishop, even as strings to a lyre. So you've got this image of, so far, by the way, you have the threefold, the threefold ministry, the bishops, the priests, and the deacons, clearly spoken about here in St. Ignatius' letter. And he's saying, you make yourself in harmony with the bishop, just as the priests are in harmony with the teaching of the bishop. What he's emphasizing here is not, I agree administratively with every decision. Not, I uh, like the way he spoke that message. What he's saying here is, make yourselves in harmony with the teaching of the bishop, or really, in the teaching of the church. And he gives this beautiful imagery of a harp. And saying, when everything is in tune together, it makes beautiful music. It makes beautiful music. And what does that beautiful music do? It draws people to it. Okay? That is the fruit of unity. When everything is attuned together, when our love for each other extends to beyond the four walls, when our teaching is in harmony with each other, when we receive others as if Christ himself, as if the whole body of Christ were coming, all that bears fruit. All that is the name that is spoken about and is declared. Let me tell you one of the, the, the important things I, I believe as a church is critical is that when we speak the same thing as far as the teaching goes, you know the old African proverbs, it takes a village to raise a child. I believe it takes an entire church community for all of us to be raised up. And so when we're saying, okay, we are seeking to be in harmony with the mind of Christ, which is in the bishop, in the church, so to speak, then that also allows all of us to rise up and for this beautiful song to be sung. Let's flip to the back. There's, there's so much in that fourth chapter, but I'm just going to go through these last few very quickly. The fifth chapter is all about Eucharistic unity. If you look on the fourth line in chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Let no man be deceived. If anyone is not with the area within the area of the altar, he lacks the bread of God. If the prayer of one and another has such a great force, this is that, that imagery in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 to 20, where it says, If two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst, right? He says, If the prayer of one and another has such a great force, how much more that of the bishop and of the whole church? He's saying, When the whole church comes together around the altar of God, the, uh, the, the area of the altar, and the bread of God is given to us, he says, There's power there. There is power in us tearing down our egos and going, pushing past our circumstances of life and being together around the one body of Christ. Submission is the willing, is not us saying I'm less than or I'm weak or I'm nothing, but submission is rather the willingness to give up my rights to myself. It's me saying, I, all things are lawful, but not all things edify. Okay? Chapter 6. Chapter 6, he tells us again, remain in truth to maintain unity. And in chapter 6 and 7 and 8, you're going to find Ignatius talking about wrong teaching. Okay, so he, he goes from the importance of unity and submission and how that unity 
communicates something powerfully to the world. Then he goes to the Eucharist, and now he's coming to the teaching. In chapters 6, 7, and 8, he really emphasizes very clearly, if you look in, in right before chapter 6, verse 2, he says, Plainly, therefore, we ought to regard the bishop as the Lord himself. Now, some people hear that, and that makes them very uncomfortable. Look on your footnote or in your side note there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to who? To the Lord. <laughs> same exact language, by the way. Same exact language that Paul uses within a marriage relationship. <coughs> Ignatius, God bless you, Ignatius is using within the church. He's saying, submit yourself, regard your, the bishop as the Lord himself. Okay? We're not saying that he is the Lord. We're saying regard him in, just in the same way that the, the, the husband is not the Lord. He's not the Christ, right? Uh, in the same way that the parents are not the Lord and that the children su should submit. But rather regard him as if he was the Lord himself. In other words, it's all about seeking to be in unity with Christ in, in the church. And the whole idea here in this chapter is about submitting to truth as presented by the church. The last line there, verse 2, he says, Now Onesimus, who is the bishop, of his own accord highly praises your conduct, your orderly conduct in God, for that you all live according to truth. He's saying your life is in order. Why? Because you live according to truth, right? If my life is disrupted, it's because I'm living, I'm not sure what I'm listening to. I might be listening to all sorts of different things, so my life becomes chaotic. And that no heresy has a home amongst you. No false teaching has found its way amongst you. No, you do not so much as listen to anyone if he speaks anything else except concerning Jesus Christ in truth. He's not just saying someone speaks to you Jesus Christ. He's saying that they speak truth about Christ. Which is the whole reason why we did this last series, Mysterious Figures, in early Christianity. Because, and I've, I've told you all this before, and I say this every time I open up the Orthodox Foundations class that we teach. If you ever hear me sit up and say, I think this verse means something in particular. And it appears to you as being outside of the teaching of the church, then it is your responsibility and my responsibility to say, who cares what I think or you think? Let's find out what the early church taught and believed and understood about this specific passage. Ultimately, you don't care how I interpret a passage. You want to know that I'm remaining faithful to interpreting it, understanding it, according to the early Christian understanding of it. Is that fair? So this is what he is telling us here. He's saying that we should not accept anything concerning Jesus Christ in truth. There's a lot of Jesus Christ that is preached out there. But he's saying be sure to receive that which is in truth. Chapter 7, he talks all about avoiding false teaching. He says some are accustomed to hunt in a cunningly destructive manner. He's saying some people want to tear down and hunt out in a destructive way those after the name, while they do certain other things unworthy of God. These men you should avoid as wild beasts, for they are mad dogs. They're savages, in other words, okay? They'll destroy you. We've heard this language used out there between different religious groups, different denominations. I mean, you hear people talk this way all the time. St. Ignatius is saying, this is dangerous stuff, okay? Be safe, be on guard, because you, wrong teaching, we don't, we don't oftentimes think of that, right? We oftentimes think, like, it's not that big of a deal. Why do people make such a big deal about differences in teaching? And he clarifies that because he says the previous, in chapter 6, he says, when you have all these different ideas that are not in harmony, imagine if one string on this piano is not in harmony, is out of tune. What does it do? It, it ruins the piano. If one of the strings breaks, you, you can't use it for a performance. You can't, it would be, 
It would be lousy. It would sound terrible. Okay? You might be... Let's be real. You can't use it. Okay? I, I, I'm trying to figure out, is there a way? What St. Ignatius is here saying is that the teaching should be in harmony with that of the church. He's saying that this is important because when it is, our lives are ordered. When our lives are ordered and our lives are in unity as a church, as a body, as a family, as families, as Christians, then what happens is other people are drawn to the name of Christ. This is not just about us. This is not about us, like people saying, no, no, we have to have this, it has to be this. This is about us saying, no, no, no. There's something far greater than you or me. It's not about me. It's not about you. If someone came and said, your teaching on this is wrong, I would say, fine, show me, explain to me, good, good, let's, there's a better way of doing it, excellent, I'll submit to that. Let me give it a, a completely different angle. We're starting uh, some discussions about the building for the church, and I've already told the building committee repeatedly, so there are some things in the church I can't negotiate about like teaching. We can't negotiate about right and wrong teaching. It's either right or it's wrong. If it's right, we submit to it. If it's wrong, then we correct it and we submit to the right teaching. But if the building committee decides unanimously with the approval of the church that you guys want to have rainbow and pink flowers all over the church walls, I will not be thrilled about it. I'll be less than happy about it, but I would submit. I pray to God that better senses went out, okay? But I would submit to that if that's what everyone in the church, pray to God, that doesn't happen, okay? With teaching, we can't do that. With teaching, it's we don't just figure out things democratically, okay? There's only one physician of flesh and of spirit, generate, generate being like generated and ingenerated, like begot, Either um, he came into, like Christ was born in the flesh, but he's also eternal. That's what that section means. He was the life of, in death, son of Mary, son of God, first passable, then impassable, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's saying the issue that they're dealing with by the time here is docetism, Gnosticism. It's this idea that Jesus Christ was not really both divine and human. Some people are saying he was one or the other. And it's very clear here that St. Ignatius is emphasizing and implying the human and the divine natures. Chapter 8, just about finished here. Let no man, let no one therefore deceive you. He goes on and talks more about the idea of deception. He's again emphasizing the importance of remaining completely devoted to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, St. Paul tells us that the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit, but considers them foolishness. Okay? He's saying that we are to remain devoted so that we wouldn't be deceived. That's what chapter 8 is about. And when we remain devoted to the work of the Holy Spirit, we then are not deceived by our flesh. Sometimes we will say things like, I don't, feel, I don't feel like that, or I feel like that's wrong, or I'm uncomfortable with that specific thing, with whatever it may be, with flow pink flowers on the walls, okay? I'm personally uncomfortable with that, okay? Maybe that's probably not the best example for this, but let's just say there's something that we say, I'm uncomfortable with it. And part of that may be our own flesh is uncomfortable with something. We have grown up in a certain way that we're uncomfortable with a specific thing. And what St. Ignatius and St. Paul here are both saying, by the way, is that we want to be spiritual people, not carnal people. In Jeremiah, I believe it's 19, he says that the heart is deceitful, deceitfully wicked beyond all things who can know it. Sometimes we want to submit to what our flesh or what our inner desires want. And what he's telling us here is, no, remain completely devoted to being people of God, to be spiritual people, to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. For this week, we're going to wrap up with chapter 9. Because all of this, he says, 
a life of complete devotion will produce joy. That's what brings joy out in our lives. But I've learned that certain persons pass through you from far away. He's saying, some people travel a long way to deceive you, bringing evil doctrine. And then he says, when you ref and then he gives three, parable, uh, three parables or examples, by the way, and I highlighted them for you there. It says, it's one of seeds, sowing seeds, it's stones of a temple, and it's a feastal procession. He's saying, when they came to sow their seeds, you stopped up your ears. You refused to listen. Okay? The next section he talks about stones of temple. He says, in so doing, you became stones of a temple that you were prepared beforehand for a building of God the Father and you were raised up. This beautiful building was erected and when a beautiful building is erected, people can't help but take, take notice of it. And he says that your being raised up was through the engine of Jesus Christ and that engine of Jesus Christ he describes as the cross. That the engine, the power of Christ, that the way that we are raised up through this engine is by dying to ourselves. Ignatius is saying this, saying, I'm about to go and die myself, but I'm willing to submit and to take up my cross. And using for a rope the Holy Spirit. He's saying that the cross, me dying to myself, is what lifts me up, but the rope that's going to pull that tower up, the temple up, is itself the Holy Spirit. To be spiritual people, not carnal people. And then he concludes with one final example in verse 2. He says, so then you are all companions in this feastal uh, procession. Along the way, and he's speaking to a people where there are at the time in Ephesus a lot of people that have various pagan deities. And what they would do is they would hang shrines around themselves, like little necklaces, of their deity. And this is the example, this is the image that St. Ignatius is using. He says, so then you are all companions in the feastal procession along the way, carrying your God and your shrine, your Christ. The, the shrine is not something to be physically carried, but he is your Christ and your holy things, being arrayed from head to foot in the commandments of Jesus Christ. What happens? In a feastal procession, everyone comes out to watch and they say, that is a beautiful celebration. And they're drawn to that celebration. And for us, the feastal procession is not arraying ourselves with all these funny looking things, but rather we array ourselves by keeping the commands of God. He concludes the chapter by saying, set not your love on anything after the common life of men, but only of God. This whole section is all about unity and how when we remain completely devoted to Christ, this produces a true joy in our life, a true celebration in our life that witnesses to others.